So the idea behind a C player, as I've defined it, is someone that will show up at the time you've asked them to and they'll depart, but they're always going to do the bare minimum to keep the job. A B player will step up and do a little bit more, but they're only going to do what's asked. They're not going to go above and beyond. And an A player is the kind of individual where if you approach them on Friday afternoon about something that's due on Monday, they're either going to tell you, I already finished it, I already thought about it, it's already packaged, or they're going to be like, oh my gosh, I got to get this done. I'm so sorry I didn't think of it sooner. I'll make it happen over the weekend. And that level of passion that comes from an A player is somebody that wants to go to war with you because they feel like they believe in the mission of the company and they're just so jazzed to be a part of it. Why don't we just go ahead and start talking about your company then and sure. the name of it and where you're located, if you don't mind, and yeah, like who sure. you are. Let's just go ahead and get going. Sure. Well, thanks, Austin, for having me on your podcast today. It's quite an honor to be amongst all the people that you have. As you know, I'm CEO of Alligator Tech. It's a company I started 24 years ago. Oftentimes, people ask, how did you come up with the name? I founded this out of my bedroom. And at the time, I was looking for a name that was catchy. And there were a lot of names out there with CompU this or Micro this, so Microsoft, Micro H, CompuSoft, CompuSA. I was looking for something that would send us apart, and so we chose Alligator, and our name of the company at the time was Alligator Computer System. We focused on putting Byte into your productivity, so Byte spelled B-Y-T-E, so... Clever. I got it. That's, uh, that's how we came to be, and we are based here in Chicago, not in Florida, like some may assume. Yeah. Can you just tell us a little bit about your background and who you are? Yeah, yeah. So born in Ohio in Cincinnati, but I've grown up in and around Chicago since I was five. Went to University of Chicago and then was out east for a while in New York at Stony Brook and then came back, worked in banking for a short while and then started Alligator Tech. My dad had worked in corporate America his whole life. He saw that I might not fit that mold of climbing the corporate ladder. So he encouraged me to start right out of school. So what did he see in you that he didn't think that you would be able to climb the corporate ladder? I think he saw two things. One, he had hit a ceiling himself and he thought that there was a good chance that I might hit it. And I think he also knew that he had more patience than I did. I was always a little impetuous, a little bit more restless. I think he thought I would get frustrated sooner. So he knew that if I, once I got saddled with, you know, a mortgage and kids and and life that I may not be able to break free. So he encouraged me to start before all that happened. Did you think he wanted to live, I guess, somewhat vicariously through you being able to do that? I would. In fact, he saw it as partly perhaps his exit strategy as well, because if I could grow something, then perhaps he could participate. And you're right. He wanted to live some, do some things. He had started a company when he was younger and it never took off. I think that might be very well the case. How about your family background? I mean, are they from Chicago? Yeah, so my parents are, um, I guess I'm uh, first generation. My parents came over in the early 60s. They both were straight from India. My dad did his graduate degree here. So I was born in Cincinnati. I have one sibling, one sister. Grew up here in the, in the Chicago market. Where did you go to college from Chicago? Yeah, so I went to the University of Chicago in Hyde Park. Did a degree in applied math of all degrees. And so that got your interest in computers? Yeah, I always knew that I tinkered with computers. I'm one of those kids that had a Commodore 64 and Atari and played with those on the side. But I always thought that it was a glorified calculator, meaning I always thought that technology was an enabler to do something, but that you really needed to figure out what you wanted to do and let technology be the enabler. So I didn't want to be that guy that was a tech guy. So I went to school for a liberal arts degree, and that's why I specialized in math. You're specialized in math at that point. And so at what point did you actually start your company? Did you actually go work for another company at first or did you start Alligator Tech right then? No, no. So I finished my math degree, went out to New York, got a degree in computer science. And then I came back, worked in banking for a short while for an international bank in Chicago. And then I started. So pretty much within a year of graduating with my master's is when I started. Did you learn anything at that bank? I learned a little bit about corporate America, what it's like to be in a bureaucracy. 
to do what you're told and sort of fit into a, a box. Yeah, I guess that you didn't enjoy that at that point, and that's when you said, let's go ahead and do my own thing. I hark back to if you ever watch Star Trek and you think about how James Kirk won the command of his vessel to pass the exam, and he basically had to rewire the exam in order to have his own rules so he could win and beat the exam. And I always thought of entrepreneurship as the ability to kind of hardware or rewire the game to be what you want it to be versus having to fit into someone else's paradigm. Did you save up your money while you were at the old company? Yeah, so I didn't work long enough to really save up any money, which is why I started out of a spare bedroom. I basically lived at home. My expenses, my room and board were paid for, and I simply kind of started from scratch. I think that first year in business, we did 30000 in revenue. Did you feel successful at that point? I felt like I was on the move, but no, I didn't feel successful because I knew that it was a long road. I think I didn't have a lot of peer support, and that's something that I have today through some organizations I'm involved in. But back then, I felt very much alone and therefore always felt like I could have and should have done more sooner. Yeah, no, well, thank you for revealing that. I think that's why a lot of the people who are listening are listening because they kind of feel that way. Could you expand on that a little bit more? Yeah, I think there's a principle called falling into the gap. It really looks at the fact when you look as a small child out at the horizon and you see the sun, you know that no matter how far you run, you're never really going to catch that, you know, get to the sun, right, or reach the horizon. But our goals are a lot like that. And what often happens is we set goals, and I've done this, I set goals, and then I don't reach them. And then I feel very badly about them. And I fall into what we call the gap. Now, you know, we set goals when we're looking forward, but we measure looking backward. In other words, Yes, I said I we would be 25% higher in revenue this year than last year. But because we set that goal, look, we're only 15% higher. Recognizing and taking stock in what works, but setting the goals looking forward. As I tell you, I'm reminding myself again and again. When you're at home with your parents, so did you have any friends that were, you said you didn't have a lot of peers at that point. What did that feel like? Yeah, it felt a bit lonely. It's tough when you're 23 and not having any peers that are, you know, everyone I had gone to school with was either working, many of them went into medicine. So they were all on these pre-subscribed paths. And I was sort of charting my own path, not really knowing what the next step is. I guess after that first year, I would have felt successful being in your shoes. At least it stinks that maybe you're at your parents' house. But so that's what I'm just trying to gauge is that did you feel dejected at all or happy because you're at home? But at the same time, I could see from your viewpoint that at least you're making money at that point and hoping what would happen next. I always had this picture in my mind that success meant having an office in an office building, having a stable of employees. Since I was working from home, very little revenue and the fact that I was on my own, it didn't feel as complete. That was my challenge. After that first year, what happened then? And can you tell us how, what year this was so we get a better time frame? This was 93. So 1993. I see ourselves in four iterations for our company. The first iteration, version 1.0, lasted about 11 years. That started in 93 and lasted up till 2003. That period of time was when it was very much continuing. I did move out of my parents' bedroom, moved into my own house, but then was still working out of a bedroom in my and my new house. It was more stitching together of subcontractors and other players to build an ecosystem as opposed to really a true company. Did you feel lonelier then when you moved out of your parents' house? And was that year two that you did that? Or when exactly did that happen? That happened probably in year, uh, let's see, year three. I didn't because now I felt the measure of success because it was moved on and had some capital, had some assets, you know, and here I was kind of breaking on my own. I would say that by the time I got into the year 95, which was two years later, we landed a big contract. It was a six-figure contract. That was when I felt a little bit of like we were taking off. That first two years was much tougher. And then did you have a peer group at that point too? Because you talked about now that you're involved with those, I guess, to try to help you feel less lonely, if you will. Yeah, I, I didn't. You know, I joined a local chamber of commerce and it was a chamber of commerce that was a regional chamber. So it featured about 69 communities. And so it had a little more breadth than, let's say, the smaller merchant-based ones that you find in a lot of municipalities. 
And through there, I got a chance to meet a lot of different business owners as well as execs. And so that was my level of fellowship that I started to have. I still wouldn't call them peers, but they at least were a community. Could you tell us a little bit more about your company at that point, what you were doing, if you're still doing the same thing today, and maybe where you're making business from there? Our company at the time was Alligator Computer Systems. It was a little bit about AFAB, anything for a buck. We moved on to really looking at how could software help companies. 